Welcome on into the Wolverine.com podcast. Clayton Safey here with Chris Ballas and Anthony Broom. We are fresh off of a trip to Indianapolis for the Big Ten Championship game. Michigan, of course, winning their first title since 2004. Chris is also fresh off a trip to Nebraska just following uh, that trip for the Hoops game, a blowout win. So we'll get to that a little bit later on. But yeah, no sleep for the weary. Uh, we will be, uh, you know, in a few weeks down there for the bowl game, all the practice stuff, everything. So perfect time to sign up at the Wolverine.com. And thousands and thousands of people have flocked over from our old platform over to On3. And you can do it for just $1. So join the people over there. Man, there's like a new thread on that message board every minute. Uh, completely vibrant, uh, you know, conversation over there. And it's been it's been awesome so far. Uh, but, fellas, how are we feeling off of uh, a great trip to Indianapolis? We had a couple nice steak dinners. Uh, and then Michigan, of course, finishing the deal there, winning a title on Saturday night. I'm tired, man. <laughs> I just dropped the rental car off today. That goes to show you it's been uh, a whirlwind. And everybody's like, oh, it's, you're so lucky. And I'm like, man, I'll be lucky to sleep in my own bed. But I've got to tell you, stayed with Dr. Bajwa in uh, Nebraska, one of our subscribers and one of the nicest guys I've ever met and one of the best people, uh, one of the best families. And uh, just had an absolute blast down there. The hospitality was fantastic and slept like a king, was treated like a king. And that's my first trip to Nebraska for a basketball game. And those fans can get into it, and it can get loud there when they give them a reason to, but they didn't have a reason on Tuesday, <laughs> guys. It was an absolute blowout. It's nice to see Jawan Howard's team get back on the right track. But Indianapolis, guys, uh, spending time with you guys and, and having a blast there was amazing. Uh, it's about time we got to do that, but the job's not finished yet. It's like J Jim Harbaugh said, we've got unfinished business. It feels like the beginning. And uh, I look at that Georgia team. I like Michigan's matchup there. I think, you know, it's going to be tough to beat Georgia, but uh, I don't think they're unbeatable. And I think that with a month to prepare and as, as invested as these guys have been and with this all-in Jim Harbaugh, I like their chances to give them a really good game down there. Yeah, you know, usually when the calendar flips to December, people go south for the winter. But, Chris, you've gone to Indianapolis and Lincoln, Nebraska mm -hmm. in the yeah. last week or so. So, um yeah, I mean, what a, what an awesome weekend. I mean, you can probably hear it from my voice. I'm still kind of paying the price for it, but it's totally worth it. I mean, uh, the atmosphere was incredible. The city was incredible. Uh, everything about it was great. Everything was was top notch. And, you know, that was even before we got to the stadium on Saturday night. So uh, good time, unforgettable experience. But Chris, like you said, job's not done yet. And, um, you know, a lot of people, it seems like there's, well, you know, it's all gravy from here. You know, Georgia's Georgia. You have to go through Georgia and Alabama. And maybe Cincinnati if you want to win a national title, but you know, there's there's not a you're you're in the hunt, you're in the field, you're one of the last four teams left. Um, for all this talk about talent gap and Georgia's this and Alabama could be that, you've already sink, you've already sunk the unsinkable ship. You beat Ohio State, that's a team that's on par with any of those teams. And this is a team that uh, first of all, they get to rest this week. I think first and foremost, that's huge. Um, I think to a certain extent, you might wish they were playing a football game just because they're so hot right now. But for them to rest up and get three weeks to watch a team that I think is similar to them in a lot of ways, um, you know, a couple more stars next to a couple players here and there. But I think what you know, the early thoughts in that game, it's going to be a physical, tough, um, again, the term I like to use, bar fight. Uh, Iowa wasn't much of a bar fight. It was for a little bit. But I think truly uh, when that game comes on New Year's Eve, it's going to be a, you know, fisticuffs are going to be thrown and, and two physical teams kind of throwing each other around. So I'm excited for it. It's going to be a haymaker. Uh, A.B., the only disappointment was that Clayton didn't try the uh, the shrimp cocktail that we were doing. I think you're the kid yeah. that your mom didn't make you eat Brussels sprouts when you were a kid, did you? Did she, A.B., Clay? You're like a – She tried. I mean, this guy. You yeah, know what the funny thing about kid. that is, Chris, is right. that I was an extremely picky eater as a kid. So, like, when yeah. I when my family saw that video, they're like, this is not you at all. Like, this is yeah. the kid that would used to sit at the table and not finish his broccoli. And now I've got, yeah. you know – horseradish going straight into my nostrils and i wish i had it now to clear my sinuses honestly but right uh, you know it's a sign of a of a man that you can you can get do that challenge and get it done so come on hey, well, we've got two weeks maybe clay can get it done that time i was gonna say we've got two, two men here two men and one <laughs> uh, one young man that's still uh still growing but that's okay Clay. careful uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, no, but yeah, just not a, not a seafood guy necessarily. I'll do a little lobster here and there, lobster roll, mm -hmm. you know, if it's uh, nice and fresh. Um, but yeah, no, great, great weekend. And you guys both mentioned Georgia and how, 
you know, this is the team that has been number one for most of the season. Michigan, uh, I think a seven and a half point underdog, right? And, and that's what they were against Ohio State. That's what Alabama, or Alabama was a six and a half point underdog to Georgia just last weekend. So obviously shows you not insurmountable uh, at all, you know, to kind of overcome that and beat Georgia. At the same time, it's going to be uh, a really big challenge. That defense is legit, although they got exposed a little bit by Alabama. Then you think about how many weapons Alabama has. So it's going to be tough. Um, you know, but when you look at th- like how that Georgia team is built is in the trenches on the defensive side of the ball, that Jordan Davis, who's just an absolute man amongst boys, even in the SEC uh, at defensive tackle, he's going to be tough. But man, the one thing this Michigan team has going for it is that they are going to punch back or they're going to be the first ones to punch you in the mouth. You mentioned a bar fight, uh, Anthony, great, great point. And Andrew Vistardis is a guy leading that offensive line. He's not going to be afraid of Jordan Davis on the inside or, you know, their other first-team All-American linebacker. Um, So this team is red hot, as you mentioned. They got a few weeks off, but I think they can stay there. They got all the confidence in the world right now. I mean, those guys feel like they can beat any team in the country. And as Jim Harbaugh said, it doesn't matter who you're matched up with. You just got to win two games, and, hell, they got a shot. You know what the funniest part is? Is Vistardis walks in there in the post game and he's got those sweatpants on with his dead yeah, yeah. body, like, and it is they're up to about his nipples, you know. <laughs> and you're thinking this is a young Clint Eastwood, and uh, but you know what? What a warrior he was all year. And I'll I'll be the first to admit when they went into this season with him, and people were asking me on radio shows and stuff, what's the weak link on this team? And and I said I don't know how good they are at center, and I thought Zach Center had to be there, and then I saw. Andrew would start us play without a bad back. And from what people had told us, okay, you don't get that this guy was playing with pain last year and, and how banged up he was. And uh, they did a great job, Ben Herbert and those guys, getting him ready. And when he came out there, he was a different player. Uh, and he played like an animal. And you could just see when he gave Mike Sane were still a hug on the sidelines and those guys, defense, offense, you know, all different guys giving each other hugs. And you could see how tight they were as a team. Um and we kind of saw that in October, too, and that's when it really started coming together where, okay, there's something different about these guys, and maybe maybe November is going to be different. Now, we had the the farce that was the Michigan State game in, in August, late October, and, you know, if they get a couple better breaks there, as Joel Klatt said, it's not just us Wolverine.com guys, but, you know, you get a better couple better breaks there, you're probably undefeated at this point. But I think that game kind of galvanized them, too. And really got them focused on, hey, now we can't slip up. Uh, and what an unbelievable job they did. So, uh, But I love this team. I love covering this team. This is literally one of the top three teams that I've ever uh, been a part of or seen in my 40-plus years covering Michigan football. It will go down that way, guys, no matter what happens in this playoff. Yeah, what were the, what were the other two teams? 97 and 1905? Was that the other one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, nineteen oh one. Thanks, uh, AB. Okay. I'm not John Gordon here. <laughs> no, I, I, funny. I, it was no. I was all, tying that in with uh, you know this is only the third time in program history they've ever won twelve games. That's uh, right. Ever have won thirteen games, so that's still on the, um, that's still there for them. Yeah, I mean, if you're like you guys, I'm sure. Hope, assuming it's a competitive game and things go right, I would assume you and Skeen are going to have a lot of fun doing the in, in the trenches for the uh, the Georgia game because those guys are so stout up front, and Michigan is. I mean. That's the one thing. I mean, um, you know, they have – it's just, you know, it's iron sharpening iron. It's it's the unstoppable force versus the immovable object. I mean, it's going to be – I mean, there's a lot we have to dive into with that George game. But, yeah, I mean, I look at this playoff field, and, yeah, would it be true that if Michigan was to win a national title, it would be the hardest road ever to get there? Yeah, probably. But I, they've they've knocked off every single narrative. I mean, the coach isn't even wearing khakis anymore. Like it's all right. gone. So it uh, it's been so so impressive um, the way they've been able to. You know, before it seemed like they were kind of. Uh, you know, we all watch the games. We see what ailed them and things that have held them back. And it seemed like they've kind of you know put the earmuffs on or went into the submarine and just kind of like la 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 la. Nope, we're Michigan. Doesn't matter. We got this. It seems like this off season there was a real effort to listen to that, look in the mirror, internalize it, and use it. Don't dwell on it. Just use it to get better. And that. That I think is the most impressive thing to me is the way they've been able to turn the page and um, you know, in a piece that'll be up probably by the time the show is up, talk about some of the surprises from the season. To me, it's just the it's the counter punch and the punch that they've thrown all season long. I mean, to your point, Chris, it started to feel different around that Wisconsin game. Now, that was easy that easily erased what happened the week before, which was kind of a bit of a disastrous second half against Rutgers. 
But that Wisconsin game to me was really kind of their turning point. We were like, this team has a little more juice than the, these teams had before. And like you said, a couple more breaks in East Lansing and a couple more plays here and there, you're undefeated. But as we said before, it's kind of crazy. Like if they had won that game, they still you know, just swap out the result. They're still Big Ten champs, and they're still probably number two in the country. So did want, didn't wind up changing a lot, but I did think it, uh, it helped them refocus and move forward and uh, make sure make darn sure it didn't happen again, to quote their head coach. I think they would have been number two uh, going into that game. I think they'd be number one now and probably playing Cincinnati. Uh, however, you know what? As Jim Harbaugh said, you got to play two to win anyway. So give us the top two, right? And who knows? Maybe Cincinnati pulls the upset against Alabama. But the third team, since you asked, was 1985. I loved that team. And when I talked to Jamie Morris, Michigan's former running back on the M zone, we talk about the comparisons between 85 and this team. 84 team going into 85 before you guys were born. They were 6-6. Six and six. They had poor leadership at the top. Uh, they came back the following year with a purpose, just like this team did in the spring. Bo Schembechler said it felt different. And Jim Harbaugh said this team felt different in the spring. He said that's when you could feel it. That was built the same way. You've got a few stars, but more than anything, you've got a tight-knit group, guys, that really plays well together and loves each other. That is absolutely huge. Anybody who ever played will tell you that is one of the facets of a championship team that you absolutely must have. There's no question. Uh, and you guys talk about when it started. Felt like also that Nebraska game. You know, you didn't play a great game all the way through, but you had the quality. And it is a very important quality to be able to pull out wins at the end of games. And we saw it against Penn State as well. There's just so many little moments throughout this season that needed to happen in order for them to be in this spot. It all culminated against uh, culminated against Ohio State and Iowa in the Big Ten championship game. Um, let's talk about a little bit of the news kind of today that uh, surfaced Josh Gaddis, who's been on hot boards. Man, I was you know, writing the story for this, and it was looking at, you know, how many schools have kind of, or at least the media surrounding that school have named him as a guy who would be a potential fit. Detroit Lions offensive coordinator uh, was one of them, which is crazy. Uh, and then head coaching jobs for several others. Duke is one of them. Virginia is the one where it looks like, uh, you know, he's a candidate for as well. That's kind of been a, uh, you know, bit of a rough look there for the search. I mean, I know Michigan's gone through that in the past as well, but, uh, you know, candidate turning it down and things like that. Um, now Gaddis, you know, just won the Broyles award. I thought, you know, he was deserving of that, you know, based on the way Michigan played offensively, had a lot of uh, great coaches. I mean, there were several guys on this staff that I think could have won it. Sharon Moore, his co-offensive coordinator being one of them as well. And Mike McDonald, I know, Chris, you wrote a great column about that as well. But uh, your guys' thoughts on kind of just generally Josh Gaddis, what he's done this year, uh, up for a head coaching job now, Broyles Award. And, uh, you know, man, a year ago you wouldn't have thought maybe that he'd be in this spot, but credit to him. Yeah, a year ago they were talking about potentially replacing him, and now that he's doing man ball in space, as the flight cast on our board put it, and I thought that was great, <laughs> man ball in space. Um, it kind of summed it up, right? He played – it's funny, the irony being – that he played, you know, the last few years, it's like, oh, Harbaugh is putting the shackles on him and he's not letting him run what he wants to run. Well, this year, he's running Jim Harbaugh's offense at Stanford and he's doing it brilliantly. Uh, some of the calls that he made, and we'll go back to Penn State, the Eric All pass, when he sees something on film, uh, they thought, okay, this is a play that could be big and could really work. Uh, and it did, and it goes for the winning score. Um, if you look at some of the, the play calls, we always say, why don't they save that play for a bigger game or so on and so forth? Well, it's all based on tendencies, right? And he pulls out that halfback pass, guys, against uh, Iowa at the perfect time. You get up in that game, 14 to nothing, there's a pretty darn good chance you're going to win it. And to pull it out there and be up two scores was absolutely huge. Uh, and they worked to perfection, guys, when they ran them. That's the funny part. Cade McNamara said, you know, he hadn't dropped a dime like that in practice. Uh, you know, that was a perfect throw. And there was a point at the end of the game, guys, when we were trying to figure out who the MVP was. And we're like, maybe Donovan Edwards, you know, for that and, and then a couple other plays. So, but he's done a fantastic job. And, uh, and he was getting emotional when he accepted the Broyles Award. What we've heard about that uh, coaching search is that he has ties on the East Coast. He's got family there that he probably would like to be close to for various reasons. And I could definitely see that happening, um, whether it's Duke, whether it's Virginia. Uh, I think that's the area that he would prefer to be if he moves on. 
and uh, certainly not wishing that at this point, but uh, he seems ready for that next step. And that's always been his goal, right? Uh, that's everybody's goal in that position for the most part, with the exception of Brett Venables, apparently, to be a head coach after you've had great success as a coordinator. So wish him all the best no matter what happens. But again, unfinished business, and he'd be the first to tell you, man, we got we got a couple games here to play first before we move on. I would think you would want to coach these next couple games, potentially. I, I know when you're head coach, it's a little different. Um and also, yeah, from Durham, Josh Gaddis went to Wake Forest. So it feels like he's kind of neck of the woods, as you mentioned. AB. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And one other thing uh, about that is that uh, I really don't know what I was going to say. So go ahead, AB. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long what week. What you're going to do is throw it to me. Uh, yeah, he kind of seems like an ACC guy, um, given the pedigree and things like that. Uh, something else that I wrote about in the surprises piece is that, you know, he's sort of he sort of called a shot during camp. He said, you know, we have to stay committed to running the football. you got to start games fast. You have to play complementary football. And, and the most important thing was that he had to stick to it. I think a lot of times earlier on in his career, you would see him, there wasn't like a lot of confidence in his play calls. It just seemed like it was, all right, well, let's run this and see what happens and go from there. Um, they set a tone early on this year. They were going to be uh, his catchphrase this year was physical, smart, and precise. And they knew that they had a trio of backs, too, in Hassan Haskins, Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards. They needed to get the ball, too. And, like I said, checked off all those boxes. They were, I believe, the 10th best rush offense in the FBS, and the only Power 5 school ahead of them was Ole Miss by, like, half a yard. Did a great job establishing an identity and sticking with it. Uh, even with all that, it really seems like he's made a lot of headway in how he's viewed in the last month or so. Uh, I remember they settled for some field goals in that Indiana game, um, which I, was either at the time they had either 16 or 17 red zone field goal attempts, which, which tied them with Colorado State uh, at the top of the country. They were settling for way too many field goals. And since then, Jake Moody's taken one field goal attempt. All of his other kicks have been extra points. It seems like everything has been more precise, more confident. I certainly think having the tight ends uh, as weapons in the red zone helped a lot with that. So, yeah, I mean, he's he went out and earned it um, in terms of, you know, head coaching job. Like I said, uh, I think he deserves consideration. I think schools like Duke, Virginia, kind of those mid tier power five type of programs. I think that's a good start for him. I think he can do better than, you know, taking a Mac job or something like that. So we'll see what happens. I mean, I'm sure if he was uh, I'm sure if it played out this way where he wound up back at Michigan, um people would be happy with that. But if not, I think they're confident with the guys that they have or um, they can make a hire somewhere too. So yeah, he did. De he deserves it. Uh, you know, any consideration, any of these guys get for uh, postseason awards, the offensive line, Sharon Moore, they're up for the, uh, the Joe Moore award for the best, most physical and toughest offensive line in the country. So really you just look at it. Um, Gaddis and, and Moore as those kind of co-coordinators. I think that that kind of relationship helped feed off each other this year. And, um, I think that the future is prosperous for everyone involved, uh, no matter how it plays out moving forward. So tip of the hat to Josh Gaddis. Uh, you hope for the best for all these guys, all these guys this year, because they all worked so hard. Uh, they all were on it from winter all the way to where we are now. So, you know, any sort of accolades or more money in their pocket or job titles or promotions elsewhere, everyone that's on this team and in that building right now deserves it. What I was going to say is I believe that if Gaddis were, okay, if he, he were to move on, and I don't think he will, I think he'll coach, but I think he'd promote Matt Weiss, and I think that was kind of the goal if Gaddis were to move on, if he was ready, uh, was to get Matt Weiss involved and, uh, and Sharon Moore, obviously, as the co-offensive coordinators. Uh, Michigan's quarterbacks coach being, a, a, you know, having come over from the Ravens, uh, they gave him a ton of money, guys, if he was just going to be a quarterback's coach, let's put it that way. So, uh, And what two great hires those were, Mike McDonald and Matt Weiss. You know, we should have known that John Harbaugh wouldn't steer his brother wrong uh and he certainly did not you're right yeah he's matt weiss actually making more money than sharon moore not to create any sort of divide in the building but uh right, yeah so right. he, he certainly uh and man he's got like a class working for him uh that are running some numbers for him on the weekly so there's a lot going on like matt weiss is fascinating to me because of his background and and all that and obviously he's done a great job with these guys as well and chris as you mentioned the mike mcdonald everyone go check out chris's column on that uh, at the Wolverine.com, because you got to remember as well not to take anything from Josh Gaddis, but Jim Harbaugh was actually the one to nominate Josh Gaddis for the Broyles Award 
to be in that pool that was considered to then be a finalist and then win it. Uh, and he could have done the same for Mike McDonald because that defense, if you look at the numbers and you look at 2020 and you look at 2021, uh, you know, now they're top 10 in both or top 15 in scoring and total defense, top 25 in pass defense, top 15, I think, in rushing. Uh, just outstanding, outstanding play from that side of the ball as well. Um, no game this weekend, but Aiden Hutchinson, man, he is busy flying all over the country for these awards. He picked up the uh, Lombardi Award for the best lineman on either side of the ball in the country Saturday night. He will be in New York for the Heisman Trophy, one of 11 ever defensive finalists joining two other Michigan Wolverines, obviously Charles Woodson. 97, Jabril Peppers in 2016, guys, he's racking stuff up. He deserves it as well. We talk about how deserving these guys are. Aiden Hutchinson might be the best player in the country. I don't think he's going to win that award, but it's uh, pretty cool to see him be able to be honored there. Yeah, Bryce Young will win it, right? And I think he kind of clinched it. We said going in that he had a chance, and uh, and he was the MVP of that game. You go back and watch it and some of the pressures he had. And, and Iowa did a good job cutting these, these guys and doing some different things, uh, Max protecting, uh, giving him more attention, and he still made an impact on that game. So uh, whether it was with pressures, whether it was the, with a sack, you think he only had four tackles, but they were trying to avoid him at all costs. So, And he still did uh, one heck of a job. So what a story that is. And just goes to show you, you know, when everybody says, well, why would you come back, you know, if you're going to be a projected top first two two round pick? Well, guess what? I think this is exactly why. Same thing with Trey Burke back in the day. And it just kind of reminds me of it, this awards the ceremony from, from city to city and racking up the hardware reminds me of when John Beeline was following Trey Burke around the country and, and not getting any sleep. And it was for a good reason. I, uh, you know, he takes home all the big awards and uh, it was a lot of fun. So uh, well-deserved what a captain he's been. Uh, he will go down as a Michigan legend. I, I, you know what people say, Oh, that seems a little, you know, is he going to be up there with Charles Woodson and Desmond Howard and Tom Harmon? No, cause he's not going to win the Heisman. But if there's like a tier that's an eighth of an inch below or whatever that, that's where where he is uh, and deserves every bit of it. Yeah, he sure does. And I think that uh, when I talked to uh, Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl back in, I think it was mid-October, whatever Michigan's bye week was, he's, he talked about like, you know, we we had a conversation uh, about um, if Aiden should go or what, what the deal is. And he said, I think you can do a lot by coming back and, finishing out your senior year and seeing what you can do to help Michigan win a big 10 championship. And uh, he did all of that. And he, like I said, I know there's a lot of um, it's so hard because there's, I think over 130 FBS football teams and only four players from all of those teams get to go to the Heisman trophy ceremony. And you can only vote for three of them. There's over 870 people. So um, like I said, I mean, that's an award for, Guys, like to me, it's inherently who's great, who elevates the program and their team uh, in addition to putting up big numbers. You know, I can take her honestly, to be frank, I can take or leave, quite frankly, leave the quarterbacks on these super high powered offenses that put up big numbers. Like, I'll just say it here. I mean, CJ, should CJ Stroud really be there or be in consideration more than Aiden Hutchinson is? I mean, you could plug any of us in there will throw for 300 yards and four touchdowns. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, Aiden Hutchinson. I mean, he's not going to win it because I think Bryce Young pretty much locked it up, but he deserves every piece of hardware and then some, and you know what? He's about to get some academic awards too, which people will kind of poo poo that because it's football first and, and you know, Michigan won the big 10, but this guy doesn't, he's not just a football freak. He's, he puts that much work into everything he does. And, Every single award that he gets is 100% deserved, and I'm really happy for that guy. So, No doubt. Should we uh, finish real quick with basketball, which, uh, sure. man, Wednesday night or Tuesday night, watching that game, and I said, man, it's hard to believe that that North Carolina game was six days ago only because what this team did in a matter of a week, and I know, you know North Carolina is not great, but it was the best competition they played in that stretch. That second half when they kind of quit – the defense went down the drain. I know, you know, Hunter Dickinson was on the bench for, you know, a big stretch there with foul trouble. But what you did Saturday with a really, really clean offensive performance, uh, especially in that second half, and then Nebraska, the whole game. I mean, they came out and, uh, you know, I think Robbie Hummel said, like, Nebraska doesn't even look like they want to be here right now. And they're playing a home game against a marquee opponent. So it was kind of baffling to see that. Now, I did talk to 
uh, you know, one of their writers over there that covers Nebraska, and he said this team uh, could go downhill really quick after those two losses, and it seemed like that was kind of what happened. But nonetheless, Michigan in a 102-67 dominant win got a lot of their swagger back, and it kind of feels like, one, you know, maybe not the top five team they were supposed to be coming into the year yet. And, I, you know, who knows? I'm not going to rule that out at this point after a good week. Not going to predict it either, but it feels like a top 25 team again and uh, a lot of talent that they can kind of get even further. Yeah, being there and watching the body language, guys, the fight that they did not put up was really eye-opening. And Fred Hoiberg talked about it after the game, the Nebraska coach. He said, we got to be better because that was ridiculous, and it was. But the ball movement was better, and they're going to be – they're going to be playing much more athletic teams. Uh, although the, Nebraska has a couple guys, right. That can get downhill. Um, at the same time, uh, they're going to be teams that are better that come to play that, that are going to know your weaknesses. They're going to get into Devonte Jones at guard, you know, is Frankie Collins going to be able to step up and, and get into the lane against some of these better defenders. That's what we're going to find out. But uh, overall, you can't ask for more than what they did in, in this last game. Uh, and to start the big 10 that way on the road, I don't care who it is. And I've said it a million times, a road win in the big 10 is a big deal. Uh, you, you know, to win on the, that's what's going to determine whether or not you compete for championships is if you went on the road and uh, because most teams are going to hold serve at home. So, so at least most contenders will. So that was a great start. Minnesota at home on Saturday, guys. You get off to a 2-0 Big Ten start. And then you've got, after a couple of, of uh, dud games, and I think you've got Rutgers at home to, to start the Big Ten Slater, maybe on the road. Either way, a winnable game before you play Michigan State. So uh, a great start, but it seems like they're getting back to playing, as Zeb Jackson told me, Michigan basketball, where they're trusting each other. That ball is moving again around the perimeter and not sticking. And they looked much more interested, especially Hunter Dickinson, who clearly read some tweets about him from some people saying that he needed to pick it up and uh, and has done that. Yeah, you, you guys know me. I'm not much of a hot take artist, but I think Michigan's going to win a lot of basketball games if it gets 42 points combined out of Terrence Williams and Brandon Johns. <laughs> right. It's probably a good sign for them, right? Um, no, I think the biggest thing, not just about the Nebraska game, but really the last two games is that it seems like the confidence is back. And, and yeah. hitting the outside shots also has a lot to do with that too. Hunter Dickinson picking it up and starting to take his game. Like we heard the talk in the off season. Ah, he's expanded his range on his jump shot. He can play a little further out from the basket. If he's drilling threes. That opens up everything for everyone. Um, especially when you play a team like Nebraska that just doesn't have the answer inside for a guy like him either. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a slow climb, right? Uh, we can't we can't flush out what we saw last week at North Carolina. That was quite frankly an unacceptable effort, and there's a lot of work to do still. Um, you know, especially Purdue is Purdue's number one right now. Purdue looks like the team to beat in the Big Ten. Looks like if if you want the crown this year, you have to take it from them. And I loved what Javon Howard said earlier this week. We're like we're not defending anything from last year. We won it. And it's over. Like we're playing for a new championship. So last year doesn't matter. Um, so really just. It's all about the baby steps from here. Um, you know, it's so funny that like that was a get right game for a lot of guys. And then it was kind of Eli Brooks who the last couple of games has been fighting through it a little bit. So it's going to come together. It's a work in progress. Uh, you hope that they can get Musa Diabate back sooner rather than later. But right now, I mean, you're going to play another kind of um, you know, both Nebraska and Minnesota were expected to finish at the bottom of the Big Ten this year. So to have those on the 2021 side of the schedule and kind of get those out of your system. I think that's good for this team. We'll build some confidence moving forward. Then you've got a couple patsies. You go to uh, – I think there's there's actually the trip to UCF when we're in Florida as well. They'll be that's in right. Orlando. That's right. Um, get back ready for January 4th when Rutgers comes to town, and then it's really on. So uh, we'll see what happens, but good step in the right direction. Yep, no doubt. So we'll be following that as well as Michigan football. December, uh, a big month for the Wolverines. Aiden Hutchinson, Saturday night, the Heisman. Uh, all that coverage for $1 at thewolverine.com for an entire year. So that takes you through next season, too, now at this point. It takes you through signing day. It takes you through basketball signing day. Uh, you know, in you know any possible developments in the spring, is there's always stuff with roster and uh, coaching changes and assistant coaches, all of that at thewolverine.com for just $1. And we will see everybody over there.